And a lot of the big physics questions that are still being worked on are these, you know, gravity waves and particle detection. There's these massive, massive efforts, thousands of people involved. And I wanted sort of something where I could work with a small team and try to make some progress. Uh, also around that time, I had a very good friend who was suffering from bipolar disorder. And so he was having manic episodes and depressive episodes. And that got me thinking about the brain and realizing how much we still have to learn about how the brain works when it works and what goes wrong um, in these instances when it doesn't work, so like in bipolar disorder. Great. Uh, mm -hmm. And so on the side a little bit, I've tried to stay engaged with the semiconductor side of myself. So in Virginia, we worked on screen energy policy. Um, this is where the GLA Research Campus was. I was involved with getting the green energy standards um, passed through the state legislation there at a very, very small level. Um, and now I have a good friend who's directing the implementation of the CHIPS Act, um, which is this big new semiconductor bill. And I've been having some high level discussions with him about how semiconductors work so he can um, have some understanding of this initiating policy. So I haven't given up on that world entirely, but I've really fallen in love with this fundamental question of how the brain works, because it's really, as uh, I'll hopefully make you appreciate in this talk, it's really an exciting time to be in this field. There are so many new tools and technologies that we can apply to try to get um, a very detailed and in-depth level of understanding. All right, so um, to think about the building blocks of the brain, let me start with this adorable and very cool little man. This is my nephew, Elliot. Um, <laughs> he was born, I guess he's a little over a year ago now. And so I first got to meet him when he was two months. And at two months, he wasn't doing a whole lot. And so you can look at you know, the CDC's website and it had these developmental guidelines. And so at two months, what was he trying to do? He was kind of trying to keep his eyes open and track you. And he was starting to make sounds, um, you know, make sounds other than crying. So this is what his brain was working on, trying to get some neurons together to do these types of things. And then I was fortunate to get to go back and see him at eight months when he was working on this whole new set of milestones. He was this much more lively little being. And now he was working on, for example, trying to track objects when they fall behind something. So now you have to have this concept that that's a thing and it can disappear, but it's still there. That's pretty sophisticated. Um, or to make sounds that have meaning. You know, you can say mama or dada or baba, something like that. And so this ability to develop these different behaviors over time really points to the existence of discrete building blocks in the brain, or as I'm going to call them, neural circuits. So these groups of neurons are coming together to form these specific behaviors. At an abstract level, sort of think about them like this, where each little dot here is a neuron and they have the connections between them. And so in this case, let's say this group could be the make some sounds, and then that will once that form, we start to form these other groups that are making specific sounds, or you know, over here we could be um, you know, tracking an object uh, and once it falls behind something. Those are the building blocks of the brain that we're trying to um, sort of assemble and try to understand in my research group. So let's think about them at a little more detailed level. What actually makes up these building blocks, or as I'm going to call them, neural circuits? Well, they're made of distinct types of neurons that we call cell types. And we've known about uh, the existence of these different types for hundreds of years. So this is a staining of uh, some. Uh, tissue from cortex. Uh, I think this was an attack from 1989. This part of the work that I actually want to know about how these detailed standings. And you can appreciate that not all the neurons here look alike. It's very different. These interesting morphologies. Some are long and skinny, some are really wide, some send these projections all along the surface of the brain. So these are distinct cell types. And much like in an electrical circuit, you can have resistors and capacitors and transistors, and they all, all have unique electrical properties. So too do these neurons in the brain have distinct input-output properties. So some neurons can take two inputs and multiply them together. Some can do what's called coincidence detection. So they can say, you detect something here and something there. That's really useful in the visual system, for example. If you want to know things are moving, it's going to be here one second and there the next second. So you want neurons that can compare those things in time. Some can multiply them together, and there are all sorts of other wonderful things that individual neurons from these individual cell types can do. And then like an electrical circuit, you're going to connect them all up or wire them together, and that's going to generate the unique functions that we're interested in. Like, you know, storing memory or making it out. So if this is what you need to know, how do you then go about knowing it? It'd be nice sort of initially to get a catalog of the different cell types 
and their connections. So that's what I'll focus on for today's talk is efforts, sort of broad scale efforts that various research labs have been doing to get that type of data, and then specific efforts that I've worked on to analyze it and understand it. And my own research group now, we're thinking pretty deeply about how we get these different types of properties of individual neurons, but I won't discuss that at all. Is everyone with me so far? Any questions? Yeah, go ahead. If you could talk a little slower, I would catch ah. the <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Do we it? Yeah. And louder. It's slower and louder. I will work on that. Just call me out whenever I do. Is there anything I can go over again more slowly and more loudly? Uh, I was a little confused by the date at the bottom of that slide. Yes. Is that correct? 1899. Yes. Yeah. So what he did was he stained these neurons with a particular dye, and these are hand drawings. So he would look through a microscope and he would hand draw these individual types. It's actually beautiful to look at his work. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the neuroscience and the neuroscientists in the building have prints up outside their office mm -hmm. because it's just so elegant to see these cells from the brain from yeah, well over a hundred years ago. Wow. Let me just toss in there a new autobiography, not autobiography <laughs> again, a whole wonderful book. Uh, just look up biography, the whole Cajon and Fascinating story, <laughs> life story. Did you know if he drew those freehand or if he mm -hmm. had a camera loose it? Do you know, having just read it's the book? Freehand. 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 freehand, it's real art. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Okay. So how do we get this type of information about from these neural circuits, the types of cells that are involved and how they're connected? Show you a brief movie here about one effort to do this from uh, 2015. Hopefully, this will. Work. And uh, yeah, I don't know about oh, oh. sound. Oh, there we go. Did everyone hear that? This colorful cylinder is a piece of mouse brain, a very small piece. It's two hundredths of a millimeter long. It may be small, but it's a really complete inventory. Unlike previous efforts to map the brain, it contains all the cell types in this area, not just the neurons. And it's from the cortex, an area that does more sophisticated computations. Here's the area next to a human hair. That's the human Even hair. This micro sample is giving surprising hints about how the brain works. To do the study, a Harvard team used a machine to cut a piece of mouse cortex into thousands of wafer-thin slices, which they stuck on a ribbon and scanned. <laughs> Here we're moving through the stack of brain slices, like a flipbook. The team took these still images and crunched the data to rebuild the piece of brain tissue. It's from a bit of the mouse brain that receives information from the skin. Here are all the neurons which feature in some way in the speck of brain the team focused on. But they were really only able to analyze this much. They focused on two brain cell branches that interact in this portion. You can start to make out the components here. In red and green, the two main cell branches. Then all the other neurons that travel through the area at some point. Here are all the synapses, the connections that neurons make with each other. Here are the inhibitory connections, which dampen down activity. And not forgetting the non-neuronal cells, like these glia, which support the neurons and help them send messages to each other. All in an area smaller than a dust mite. <laughs> This tiny tissue sample is teaching scientists some principles of brain mechanics. Neuroscientists often assume that neurons that are neighbors are likely to connect more than distant ones. But the team was surprised to find that this pattern didn't hold. In this image, all the neuron branches are very closely packed, but only the red and yellow here in the middle are actually connected. Humans have a much bigger cortex than mice. And it's where all the interesting stuff happens like our memory and personality. But given how much data lives in this tiny piece of mouse brain, doing the same for humans is a distant prospect. Then again, nobody said the brain was going to be easy to understand, did they? 
So hopefully that gives you a sense of just the amazing amount of complexity in our brains. And that, right, that small area was what, one one thousandth a human hair. And so now you have to scale that over the entire brain. Now, were those individual neurons in the uh, if I go back, let's see if I can click on a specific area here. Uh, they had at one point you saw that red yeah. um, object going through. That was an individual neuron that they had identified. I'm not sure I can find the exact point. A lot of the rest of these are just fragments because they've taken this small volume and they've done the best they can in there, but neurons can project incredibly long distances. And so we have neurons that go from our spinal cord kind of all the way down to uh, our feet or appendages. And so now that's, you know, you're going from one one thousandth the width of the human hair to that entire length. It gives you a sense of how complicated this task is. Isn't each color a different cell, different neuron? Yes. So. So this is good job security for me. I have a question. Yes, question on Zoom. Go for it. So when you say connect, are we talking about chemical connection or electrical connection? Or when, you know, when they talk to each other, are they both? Very good question. So most of the connections we talk about are going to be chemical connections, where one neuron has what are called these vesicles. They're full of neurotransmitters, so signaling modules. And when the neuron becomes active, when it's conveying information, that's electrical information. And so you'll have some electrical signal in the form of ions coming down here, and that will cause these vesicles to then fuse and release their neurotransmitter. And there's gonna be another neuron on the other side that's gonna have a bunch of individual receptors. And they'll bind that neurotransmitter. So that's that chemical communication that will then cause positively charged ions to flow in, and that's the electrical activity. When you think about neurons being electrically active, it's those positive ions flowing in as a result of these chemical signals opening up channels for those ions to enter the cell. Um, there are also direct electrical connections between neurons. Those are more rare, and they seem to be used in very specific circumstances. So predominantly, we think about signaling happening in a chemical way like this. So that's one small part of a brain from 2015. But we've actually been able to do this type of analysis and get this type of detailed data on entire brains, just for very, very small creatures. Um, I can advance the slide here. So back in um, 1984, I believe, Sidney Brenner took on this task. He's sort of the pioneer of the field of connectomics. He's a Nobel Prize winner um, for working on this wor worm, but for different projects. Um, so this worm, it's called C. elegans, the nematode, and it has 302 neurons, and that's throughout its nervous system. So we think about, you know, I, I studied the brain, but there are other neurons around doing various sensory uh, functions in your nervous system. And so these 302 neurons include the equivalent of the fly's brain, which is a couple hundred neurons, and then the other neurons throughout its body. And so they took this worm, they embedded it in, a, in epoxy and glue and it's the hard plastic, plastic. They sliced it up, and then they used the same technique that you saw on the previous slide, electron microscopy, to image it down to nanometer scale resolution. So you can see all the individual neurons in the worm. And then uh, a team of people spent a lot of time manually going through and saying, if I have one image and the next image, I can see this neuron here, and then I can see it going through the next one. And they sort of traced it through all these different images and noted everywhere where there were connections between them. Mm -hmm. So that'll uh, then, go ahead. So that's like they took thin slices all the way through and so you can track it. Exactly, so you can imagine slicing this uh -huh. uh, worm up thousands and thousands of times and then taking a snapshot of each of those slices. And so then they could take that data and draw these circuit diagrams for neural circuits. And so this, for example, is all the neurons are involved in egg laying for the worm. So these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven neurons coordinate egg laying. That's uh, sort of finding um, a substrate that is 
nutritious and good for um, your future worm children and then laying eggs onto them. How were they able to identify those specifically as the neurons that would be related to egg laying versus some other function? So these, in the case of the worm, if you look across worms, you always find the same 302 neurons. And then there were other studies that would have to be done to say, what are these neurons involved in? And, oh, they seem to become electrically active when the worm is laying an egg. And to make that association that way. So oftentimes just knowing the connectivity isn't enough to tell you the function. Although I'll talk about some examples that we've worked on where the neurons have this amazing detailed structure that immediately points to what function they might have in the nervous system. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yes. <laughs> so what do we know yet what initiates this will? The will to lay an egg, will to move the muscle? <laughs> so if you asked me two weeks ago, I would have said no, but we just had a speaker from UC Santa Barbara, Professor Will Smith, uh, Bill Smith, come and give a talk. And he's working on an organism that has even fewer neurons than this. There are 170 neurons. It's sort of the precursor to all vertebrates. It's called a tunicate. It's in the ocean. Um, it usually attaches to the bottom of boats, and then it sort of forms basically the head of a fish, and it siphons um, food through its mouth. And he's found that in those organisms that have to sort of randomly swim around to find this safe space where they're opening an anchor, there are a few neurons that just have these sort of oscillations of electrical activity. Um, so they, you, they're sort of naturally set up with the biophysics of their structures so that they sort of become active and inactive, active and inactive. And there are a couple of them, and they together sort of create this interference that leads to this sort of random or stochastic looking behavior. It sort of seems to trigger different movements of this tunicate. And so in that simple organism, that, at least, it seems like there are a couple neurons that are sort of tasked with generally driving activity throughout the system. So I don't know in the worm or in the fly or in the mouse or in humans if we have neurons like that, but for that organism, at least, that's the first thing that they've pointed to. Um, sort of being the, in that case, I guess that's the center of free will. Uh, in the tunicate, although we're always very hesitant to say anything like that uh, in a neuroscience setting. Um, any other questions for you? Okay, so this was pretty much the entire nervous system of this small organism with 302 neurons back in 1984. At the Genelia Research Campus, I was involved with an effort to try to scale this up now from 300 neurons to almost 100,000 neurons. And we did this in the brain of a fruit fly, which is uh, sort of this amazing model organism in biology that's led to a lot of really fantastic discoveries. And so this was a great um, organism to work through. So for this, uh, in this particular case, this gray outline here is the entire brain of the fruit fly. And we did a similar thing where we embedded it in an epoxy. We sliced it up into thousands and thousands of different slices, and we managed that. Um, in this case, because this was going to be such a massive data set, we looked at just this area in blue. So we assumed that neurons that you would find in this area of the brain would be reflected through symmetry in the other side of the brain. And then all the visual processing of the fly happens out here. So this is where they learn to discriminate edges or the neurons process visual information to discriminate edges, um, features, moving objects. Um, and we had previously worked on some of that uh, neural tissue, and so we focused here on the central brain, where the fly is generating behaviors like um, porting one another or navigating to distant objects or um, learning that some smells are associated with good foods and some smells are associated with bad foods. We reviewed this as the hub of these sort of more complicated, interesting behaviors that we could imagine being reflected in, say, human brains as well. So though there are 100,000 neurons in the brain, because we were focusing on a smaller volume, we ultimately looked at closer to 25,000 neurons. And there are 20 million synapses. So those are the chemical connections. 20 million synapses are connections between neurons um, in those 25,000, uh, between those 25,000 different individual cells. Go ahead. How do you do the splicing? What is slicing? It's, uh, we use what's called a diamond knife. So it's a very, very sharp knife. And the key to this particular approach was um, you can imagine if you want to trace an individual neuron through slices, you have to get pretty thin because sometimes they might 
you know, go up or down. And if you're not slicing it thin enough, you might miss that entirely. And so what we did here was we cut them fairly thick with this diamond knife, so a very sharp knife. And then we used an ion beam called a fib beam, a focused ion beam, to mill away material. Mm -hmm. And so we would take a snapshot of the surface, and then we would basically ablate away, power wash away uh -huh. a layer, look at the next set. And that gives you a consistent it. thickness with, with each pass. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And we would have, I mean, so I was involved with the analysis side of this. When I say we, I get no credit for any of this. This was a team of people, you know, in there working with electron microscopes, but they would have um, 10 microscopes working in parallel as well. So you take, you know, 20 slices of the brain, you load 10 up, your image explodes, you know the next 10 up, you image those. It's a fairly large effort. But did you put them into epoxy also? Yeah, so the whole yeah. brain is in epoxy, and then we slice everything up, and we put it, if you remember from the uh, movie, they, there was that um, image of the uh, overall disc that had all the slices on it. You basically put them all on yeah. tape, and then you can take that to something and load that into your microscope. We do that also in capacitors, if you look at the uh, um, delamination, and then we also put it in epoxy and then you grind it down layer by layer take a picture mm -hmm. right. and th this fib technique they use for characterizing electrical circuits and electrical mm -hmm. defects all the time mm -hmm. so that's why these microscopes were actually originally developed not for sort of taking slices of the brain but for cutting up electrical circuits that weren't working to figure out why where the defects were yeah. so if you remember when i was talking about the worm work before i told you there was a dedicated team that took all those images and then traced all the neurons through so we started out with a team of 30 post -bac students, so undergrads who got their bachelor's and were looking for something to do. And we tried to give them lots of pizza and soda and put them all together and have some time and they were doing this. And that got us some of the way there. But you can imagine, this is just a tremendous amount of work. So ultimately what we did was we partnered with Google and they used these automatic reconstruction techniques to have a computer do most of this, to identify the same neuron in different images, and to tag individual synapses or connections between them. But I think they told us this used about a third of their total compute power at one time when they were running this. So at one point in time, a third of Google was focused on just this data set. I'm not sure I want to know why they were testing these different techniques and approaches, what they ultimately want to use this for. Uh, but this is the approach that was taken. Yeah. OK. So now we have most of the brain of a food fly, we have this connectivity map. We can say, what are the different types of neurons? How are they connected? So here's an example of what some of the neurons look like in this data set. And I, just like we talked about how beautiful those standings were, I really find the images of the individual neurons in the human field. Some of them have this amazing morphology. Dendrites and axons going into um, really remarkable different areas of the brain. And I'll come back to this movie later on and give you some context for what types of things these different neurons might be doing. So that's just a small subset. You know, that is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of the 25,000 neurons in this entire brain. So now that we have a map of the brain of a worm, a single worm, Although they've since done a couple more, so we can compare in, across individuals, which is a whole other interesting area. And we have a map of a brain of a fly. What about getting to a brain of a mouse or maybe even a brain of a human? And so just give you a sense of the differences in scale between this. Um, this is from a paper from 2020 where they were strongly advocating for, yes, yeah, let's do the mouse brain. Teach us so much about how mammalian brains work. Um, they compared the equivalent volume of a C. elegans brain to the width of an airline seat. You have to go a factor of a thousand bigger to get to the brain of a fly. So that's six and a half Boeing 747 airliners and then. So that's what we've done now. And then to do a mouse, that's another factor of 10,000 bigger. So that's it from Boston to Boston. We have a long way to go to get there. <laughs> but there are people working on it, and you can do smaller sections of brain. So the sort of the state of the art right now is looking at a cubic millimeter. So one millimeter on each side, very small, but you can capture some reasonable level of complexity then and, and try to understand what's going on in the underlying neurons there. So that's sort of the state of the art of this field of connectomics. And some of the people who work on this are incredibly dedicated and, and they're sort of imagining that 
before they die, they'll be able to upload their brain to a computer because they'll have this full map of it. And I'm not convinced, A, that we're anywhere close to the technology, or B, that that static picture is going to solve it. But um, there are certainly some diehards who might tell you. Any questions about that overall approach, you know, this idea of connect homes? Yeah, I have a question. Yes. <clears throat> so it, do we know if you took a slice of one part of the brain or one part of an organism, is it, the, is it uniform throughout? If you took it up, say, on the right side or the left side or the middle, would it be the same? In other words, it's homogeneous. Is the is um, You're going to find very different types of neurons in different brain areas. Right. Uh, but if you're comparing the right half and the left half, they mm -hmm. do tend to see to be very, very similar. So there is some symmetry across the brain, at least for the brain of a fruit fly. Um, right. I can't say anything about that for the brain of a mouse yet. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Along the same lines, is there variability among individuals and in how things are wired? Because just doing one fruit fly, I wonder, you know, this neighbor be the same. Yeah, great question. So we now have two fruit fly brains. <laughs> they're both they're both females. And both of those females, we, we see the trends are largely consistent, but the specific, there's differences in the specificity. And they're now doing a whole male. And we already know that there are some distinct types of neurons in the male fruit fly brain versus the female fruit fly brain. The males court the females by doing this sort of singing with their wings, and the females have to be sensitive to that. So there are distinct types of neurons involved in that. And we're curious to see what other differences there might be. So this is a it's an active area of research. It takes a long time to get any one of these data sets, and so it's a, a little bit slow to get an answer. Um, the, the connections that uh, the neurons make with each other is governed by some process in the development of the creature of human eggs, right? And is there ever um, where that doesn't quite work exactly right and the neuron gets plugged into a different area and causes some other things to happen. So we can't say that with this type of data set, but we do have genetic tools that allow us to specifically look at a small subset of the same neurons many, many times over a bunch of different flies. And if we do that, we've seen 20 of the flies all look the same, and that 21st one, there'll be this little offshoot that'll go to some other brain area that you wouldn't have expected. So there are all these sort of like, you might call it a miswiring, yeah. or that might just be how evolution is sort of working to try out these different connections. And if something works, okay, great, let's go and try to make that uh, sort of the feature then of the progeny on down and uh, we inherit it um, to lead to some new connection and new behavior. Uh -huh. So that's sort of from the hardwired perspective. Mm -hmm. There's also going to be some learning and tuning effects. And we don't see as much of that in the fly. So if you're looking in, the mouse or presumably in humans as well, you know, we can prune and form entirely new connections throughout our lifetime. Flies only live for a month, and it seems like they're a little more hardwired. And so what you get from that development, kind of what you have, you can sort of generally tune the strengths between things so you can learn something is good or something is bad, but you're not going to learn a whole new behavior as far as we know. Thank you. Okay. So we're working on more complex brains, on mammalian brains, but we're not there yet. And so in our lab, we're focusing on using the fruit fly as a model system to try to find these building blocks. Because as I always tell my students, if we can't figure out these 100,000 neurons, how do we have any hope of figuring out our on the order of 100 billion neurons? So let's start with a simple problem, figure out how to tackle it, and then build up expertise from there so that in another 50 years when we have a mouse brain, we can then apply these approaches um, to that. But even beyond that, there's pretty um, strong evidence and good reason to believe that what we identify about functional properties in the brain of a fly uh, may well be applicable to even our brains. So I'm going to walk you through an example of that from work that I did um, at the Genelia Research Campus. Go ahead. Ah, okay. Um, I'll get into this in more detail eventually, but well, 
Why don't I just do it now? So this is one set of neurons in the fibrin. So this is talking about those cell types. So I showed an example of one of these in that movie as I was stepping through. And the one neuron you saw was probably colored uh, basically like the one in red here. And so what we've done in this particular image is we've used uh, genetic tools to randomly label each individual neuron of this overall class of neurons a different color. So each color you see here is a different individual neuron. So they each form a little bit of a wedge, um, you know, a piece of pie, and overall then the entire population forms this entire beautiful circle. And this is, um, these are called the dendrites in the neurons, so that's where they're getting their inputs. So that would be through this side here, chemical signaling, they're receiving signals from other neurons in this area. And you can't quite see it, but there's sort of a faded area behind where they're sending their outputs to communicate with the next neurons downstream in this neural circuit. Have I satisfied your question? You, I'm not convinced I have. <laughs> um, I just have a couple as to why they're organized exactly that way. Let me get into that. Why they form this beautiful donut? Yeah. Yes. So this is a beautiful example of we discussed before. It's not always easy to just look at these neurons and merely tell what they do. In this case, the circle gives us a pretty strong hint into their function. Um, and their function, for example, could be tracking something that had circular symmetry, for example, an angle. So um, in 1990, a set of neurons in the, in the rat brain that have since been found in many different species were discovered that encode the rat's head direction. So there was an electrode stuck into these neurons, and every time they fired, or every time they became electrically active, that was recorded. And after the experiment was done, they looked at what the animal was doing when these neurons were firing. And they found that every time the rat was pointed in a certain direction, this one neuron was active. And then as soon as it turned away, it no longer became active. And so that's what you see in this plot, is this is the animal's head direction. So this is which way the rat is facing. And this is how active the neuron is. And so this particular neuron is tuned to just around 300 degrees. Yes? That, that's good re relative to an external reference. Yes, good question. Orientation. So with these specific cells, you can put the rat in a dark, in the dark, and um, they'll still have the specific head direction. Uh, but then if you put them into, a, or also in a you know, lit room where you see different features, then it seems to lock into that specific reference. So it'll know, okay, when the door is here, you know, the cell's always gonna fire when I'm 30 degrees clockwise from that location. But this is just going to be one neuron at a population. So another way to represent this sort of activity rate now is I'm showing angle on this axis, and this is how active the neuron is. So this one's tuned to that particular direction, and you find a bunch of these head direction cells um, that are tuned to different directions, so that as the animal spins around, different cells will become active through letting. This is sort of like the animal's internal sense of direction, its internal compass. It always knows where it's oriented in the world. And you always see the same relative um, angle between two of these neurons. So even if the animal becomes disoriented and it's this sort of angle drifts from one neuron, you'll still see that capture overall in the population. Yeah. Right, so these are these internal head direction cells. Yes. When, when they're in between, do they, they both fire, but to a both lesser extent? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so you see that they, so they have a peak, but a little bit off, they still have some activity. So if you had one cell that was peaking here and one that's there, the animals in between, they're both going to be a little bit active. But there'll be a, yet another cell that's going to be even more um, strongly activated to indicate that direction. So these are, I call them sort of the sense of direction cells, but they're officially referred to as head direction cells. And so what this means is if I told you what these neurons were doing, how active they were at any point in time, but nothing about the animal's behavior, you could totally reconstruct which way it was facing without knowing anything about what it was actually doing. So this is some kind of like internal representation then of the outside world. Yeah. You can put a probe into a particular neuron inside the brain. How do you do that? <laughs> so I'm going to tell you about 
One way we do it in the fly, what they did here in the rat is they have these electrodes. So it's a very long, thin piece of silicon. So about, you know, like a, like a human hair. It's got little electrical or um, metallic pads on it. And so those metallic pads can read the electrical signals from the neurons. And, you know, when these early experimenters were initially trying to figure out what different brain areas were doing, they just sort of stick them in, have a rat run around, and then look at everything afterwards and say, well, what was the rat doing when this neuron was active? And now that we've sort of built up a body of knowledge, we have a little more uh, sense of what these individual brain areas are doing. We can make more predictions. We can look at more complicated behaviors. But at a fundamental level, that's what was being done there, sort of electrodes stuck in. And you see this now, um, patients with Parkinson's, um, they do these deep brain stimulations. So they'll insert an electrode into a human brain all the way down to a brain area known as the basal ganglia to stimulate a specific set of neurons that um, become associated with the tremors. And it helps a lot with the condition. Um, so sort of things that were developed for, um, in that case, the mouse have now been able to help humans for human health. So these hydroxyl cells have been found across species. Uh, which in some ways makes sense. If you're an animal and you need to navigate, the first thing you need to know is you need to get your bearings. You need to know which, you know, your sense of direction. And so any animal that navigates, it makes sense that they would have these kind of head directions. They've been found in mammals like hamsters. It's presumed that humans have them. They've been found in birds. They've been found in fish. And they've even been found in fruit flies. So I'm going to show you what these cells look like in fruit flies. Um, and this is a fairly involved experiment, so I'm going to try to talk through it slowly and then stop for questions as you have them. So for these experiments, we want to be able to look at the neural activity of a fly. Flies are very, very small, and so we can't just stick an electrode in their brain and have them run around for a quarter minute. We tend to have to fix them in one place. And so we fix them with a pin. You can see the pin here. But then if we're measuring head direction cells, we want them to have some idea that they're moving and turning. And so we create this whole basically video game system for the fly, mm -hmm. where they're running on an air suspended ball. We call this our fly treadmill. Uh, so there's air coming out here, just like an air hockey table where the puck floats. Here the ball is floating, so the fly can run on it. And then we read out the position of the ball. And we used to use this using, if you remember the computer mice that you set a little ball on the bottom, mm -hmm. we use those exact sensors to read that out. And then we have that update some kind of screen that's wrapped around the fly. So it was as if they were playing that video game. They could walk up to things, they could move things around just by running on the ball. We use some more uh, modern approaches now. That was the original. And then we're going to accord neural activity. So we're going to return to these beautiful ring-shaped group of neurons and look at the neural activity in them while this fly is running on the ball. So now we see the fly from the back. And you'll notice now there's also this metal pyramid you see um, coming down right on top of the fly's head. And that pyramid is there so that we can move the fly's cuticle, the equivalent of the fly's skull, and look down into the brain. And what we've done with these flies is since uh, fruit flies have been so well studied for a long, long time, we have this amazing access to their genome, and we can sort of play around with different genetic tools. And one of the tools we use is called GCAMP. It's a genetically encoded calcium test. What does that mean? Um, we take the bioluminescent protein from jellyfish, so that's this green fluorescent protein, and we modify it so that it's usually uh, not giving off light, but when a calcium ion binds to it, it changes its shape and it now emits light. So when a neuron becomes electrically active, I talked about the ions entering the neuron and that sending the signal. Some of those ions are calcium ions. And so the neuron becomes active, positively charged calcium ions flow in, they bind to this sensor, and it fluoresces. All of which is a long way to say that instead of sticking an electrode in and measuring electrical signals, now we're looking at a microscope and measuring light coming off. And whenever we see light, that's now telling us the neuron is active. Yes? What's the time scale of uh, you know, the switching on and off the, the light and how long much of lag does it have? <laughs> yeah, good question. So they're constantly trying to make these um, fluorescent indicators better and better to more accurately capture in real time what the neuron is doing. 
In this case, neurons send waves of electrical activity called action potentials about every millisecond when the neuron is active. So that's about how long it takes an action to travel. You can't get that level of resolution with the latest and greatest of these um, fluorescent indicators, but you can get um, you know, 10 to 100 milliseconds. So you can see fairly quickly, you know, if the fly's turning and stop, that all happens on the order of hundreds of milliseconds. And so you can see that reflected in the fluorescent activity. So what you'll see in the video on top here is for this particular subset of neurons we're going to look at, this is one type of neurons, we're now going to look at the fluorescent signal within this donut. So that's the dotted white line. And the fluorescent signal, which is showing the electrical activity of these neurons, is going to be in red. So you see a little bit right here. This will be a movie, so um, you'll see a lot more in a moment. And I mentioned the fly is playing a video game. And in this case, its video game is just move a strike around me. It's not very exciting, but flies, it turns out, really love vertical features. And we think that's because if you're a fly and you want to escape, what are you going to do? You're going to find a vertical, a vertical feature, you're going to fly to that, and you're going to crawl up it. And so they are really engaged with this particular game. And each fly likes to keep this stripe at one particular position. So they'll sort of move it around, lock it in one place, and then run forward. And what you'll see in this movie is that the activity of these neurons forms a bump. And I'll compare the position of the bump to the position of the stripe, which is reading out for which way the fly is turning or, or rotated or oriented in the world. And I'll plot those two at the bottom here with a red curve for the activity of the neurons and a blue curve for the position. So you see this bump of activity, and you notice it started up here and then moved down over here. Now the fly is running great, but in a moment she's going to turn. She turns and the bump moves. And as you compare <laughs> the position of the bump, the vision of the stripe, you see they directly track one another. So this is the, these are those head direction cells. This is that internal sense of direction. So just by looking in the brain at which neurons are active, I can tell you without knowing where the fly is pointing when then, you know, by extension where the stripe is. That is so pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> a really fun set of experiments to do. So this is a lot of what we do in the lab. We sort of look at this connectivity map, we look at some of the neurons, we have some ideas about what they do, and then we can go and test them in this fly. It's sort of living its fly life, running on its little treadmill, and look at the neural activity of the cells. And they do this in mice as well. There's um, now some work doing this in macaque monkeys um, to sort of read out the fluorescent activity this way. We just also have this connectivity data that can help really form our hypotheses about what individual types of neurons are doing. Yes. Are there blind mutants that are defective in this behavior? Yes. Yeah. So you can, if you, well, what do you mean by behavior in this case? The well, sort of strike track? I don't want something that's just totally mental defective. I can't do anything. <laughs> well, yeah. You know, it's called it's root thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, are there specific mutants that would affect, say, a wedge neuron, one of the wedges? So that particular direction doesn't get sent. That's the, I, I don't know whether anyone's screening these. Yeah, so we have each of these neuron types, we have a, a yeah. genetic fly line that targets that individual. And so we can cause our own mutants. Like, so at Genelia, they had 40,000 different fly lines. They had a robot take care of all these things. Mm -hmm. And so there's basically a library of flies where each of these individual types of neurons that we find in this connectivity map we can pull a fly where we can get specific targeting of that to do these kinds of experiments. Because as you saw in that whole connectome, there are all these different neuron types in each brain area. And so if we tried to look at them all at once, I at least would be very confused. And so we're able to target them individually. So out of these 25,000 different individual neurons, there are thousands of different types. And we, can, we have a fly where that type of neuron is specifically available uh, for us to have access to then do these kinds of experiments or experiments where we can knock out or knock down these neurons and see what happens to the behavior or to other neurons that are connected to the network. Yes? It, it would seem that you need some kind of a sensory input for that thing to track the actual head movement. Is there like, like semicircular canals or, uh, you know, rot rotary um, 
accelerometer or something in the non-stud that makes it connected to so that beautifully brings me to the next slide which is how the heck does this thing work we, we saw it we could see it but i'm telling you about circuits we can figure out the detailed level of how this whole thing is going to be wired together to work and so for that um we drew inspiration from a model that actually the the rat folks created back in 95 when they first had me measured these head direction cells in the rat. And they said, okay, so we have one type of cells. So that's our ring of cells that we just observed that's holding that head direction. But you need to update it as the animal turns or as the animal sees, like if things move, maybe if you're a fly and you're flying and you get blown around, you're not feeling that in movements, but you're seeing the world move and you want to know that, okay, I rotated now or I was rotated. How does that happen? So this model suggested that you had some visual cells that would bring in direct input so that I know, for example, when I'm facing this way in the room, the door is 30 degrees that way would affect me. And also cells that would be good to bring in rotation signals. So that gets to your question about how, you know, what sort of sensory information is coming in to actually update this as the animal is turning. Um, so in mammals, we have these accelerometers in our ears that can sort of help us track that. In flies, we think what they, they have all these mechanoreceptors in their joints, in their legs. And so there are some neurons that bring that information up to the brain. And so we think they're sensing their sort of joint movements that are telling them if they're turning one way or another. And that's then going up to update this um, head direction signal. So at a high level, we maybe have three types of neurons that are involved here. We have these head direction cells. I just showed you those. We have some rotation cells, and we have the visual cells. And this model suggests that these motor signals can actually, that are coming in through these rotation cells, can shift the bump through these additional rings of neurons. So let me talk you through in a little more detail what that would mean. So if we have our set of head directed neurons, ignore the green ones uh, for now, let's just focus on the purple ones. Those are the ones we saw in the movie. The uh, theorists. So sure. I think I lost them. When you're seeing these actions, which are sort of tracking the head direction, are they motor neurons or visual neurons? So, in this case, I would say they're neither. So, there are sensory neurons bringing information in. And, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, your question is what's updating them or how I would classify these head directions? Do you know if they're motor neurons or if they're sensory visual neurons? So in this case, they're in the center of the brain, these head direction cells. So if you go, if you start at the um, photoreceptors that are detecting light changes and you march forward to see who those are connected to and then what neuron that's connected to and then what, you get five or six neurons in before you get there. So I would say this is a highly processed kind of internal signal. It's not easily classified as either like a sensory signal or a motor signal. This is something sort of more abstracted in the middle of the brain. So we have our head direction neurons. And then the diagram I just showed you said we're going to have two other rings of neurons here. I've interspersed them in red and in uh, blue. And those are going to move this head direction signal either clockwise or counterclockwise. Let's focus for the moment on just these clockwise ones and zoom in here on just the top one. So let's imagine in that movie, we saw the bump of activity that was moving around. And let's say it's at this particular location. So it's in this specific head direction neuron. These models say that there'll be a connection from this head direction neuron to this counterclockwise shift in center. So through this chemical signaling then, that would lead to some electrical activity in this outer shifting neuron. What the models also say then is those neurons are going to get input from another set of neurons that we just talked about that are going to encode, tell some information about how the animal is turning. And in this case, it'll tell if the animal is turning in one direction. And that will then give an additional input to the neuron. So now they're getting a signal, one signal from this neuron and one signal from this neuron. So that's making them twice that. And then the key to this particular conceptual idea is that these outer clockwise shifting neurons go right back to the original ring, but at a different location. And so now they're getting very strongly activated and they're going to feed back to this original ring and activate those neurons. And that's going to pull this bump of activity one way around the ring. And similarly, on the other side, you would have um, 
another input that's encoding when the animal's turning the other direction. So in this case, you want your head directed signal to move one way when you turn one way. And now you're going to turn the other way. You want to move and shift around the other way. And so you have an offset back in that direction. I'm a little worried that I lost some folks here because that's typically what I tend to do at this stage. <laughs> so, take this back. Can fruit flies hear? Do they have, because it's a vestibular mm -hmm. couple slides, they you know, is that part of the? So in this case, we're just um, the fly in this particular example, we're sense the fly is sensing whether it's turning or not. And so that is basically sensing whether it's legs. Fruit flies do have these antennae and they can sense vibrations. So as much as they hear, that's their hearing is they're sort of sensing vibrations. So they don't have anything like they don't that. Have ears. No. Any questions about? This or shall I plow forward? All right, okay. go to the next one. So we have some clear predictions then. We've observed our head directed signal in this one type of head direction neurons that was involved in the ground. And our this theory that they proposed for the rat system says, presumably that that's also similar to the human system, is that we're going to have two different other type, types of neurons. They're going to uh, be connected to this original type, but they're going to have this kind of weird offset feedback loop and that their activity is going to scale with some kind of turn signal. So here is another view of those head directed neurons that um, we looked at the movie up previously. You see that beautiful donut again. And now you can see where they're sending their output outputs, their axons up here to this other bridge like that. And let's zoom in on an individual example. So this is one of them. It's getting its input here. That's where we saw the signal, and it's sending its output. And so, what we're predicting now is that it's going to connect to another neuron up here, and that other neuron is going to come back, but not to the same location. It's going to come back to a neighbor location, and that'll allow that signal to be pulled around. And sure enough, we find a set of neurons that looks exactly like. This. So they have very similar structures. Right? You get a donut. You have a uh, so the mustache. But if we look at an example of an individual one of these neurons, they directly overlap over here, where we can look at that connectome data. We see they get that input from the head direction cells, and they send a signal back to the shifted location in the um, in the donut. You also notice there's a little third area down here that's actually sort of behind the donut. And it turns out that's where they're getting a signal that's encoding if the animal is turning in one direction or not. So they're getting those two sources of input. And if we look at the overall um, activity of those neurons using that same calcium uh, fluorescence technique, we see that as the animal turns more quickly, so this is degrees per second, down here is sort of slow turn, down here is very fast turn. And we look at the overall activity of those neurons, scales directly with how much the animal is moving. So everything that was predicted back in 1995 to explain how these cells would work in a rat, it turns out we find all this 30 years later in the brain of a fly, which to me is just amazing. There's this deep homology between these different organisms and they diverged 500 million years ago in the brain. Yeah. Are there additional systems for other axes like up and down and yeah, in the whole? This is a very good question. Um, there, it's an area of active research. No one's yet found it in fly. Bats, you can imagine, might need to encode that sort of information because they're also flying all over the place. And indeed, in the bats, you see that they sort of encode all these different angles, not just sort of. Uh, there's pitch, roll, and yaw. And I always get confused. This is pitch. This is roll. So yaw. Yeah. Not just yaw, but also pitch and. So that's an example of the kinds of questions or for the building blocks of the brain that we're really trying to get at in the fly. Say there are these fundamental organizational principles of these different cell types in the brain and how they connect and can we find them then in the fly and that will teach us something about organisms in general and how brains are wired. But that's a little abstract. That's sort of a sense of direction signal inside the brain. 
let's think through a, a sort of a full behavior of what this now. This is where I started, you know, learning to uh, say a specific set of words or learning to track an object. And so let's imagine a fly that's just finding its way back to a spot of food that it left. So it's remembering something about the direction and the distance of that piece of food. Imagine it's me trying to make my way through the door, and it needs to take some set of actions to get there. So in this case, if it's me, I have to turn right, I have to walk straight, I have to turn left. How is it figuring that out? Well, for these, yes? You use the term remembering. So I guess the memory. Yes. You haven't spoken to that? Yet? I have not. Okay. Bear with me. <laughs> um, what do you need to know? We need to know your sense of direction, which way you're going, so you know where you are relative to this thing you want to get to. You need a memory. This is what you just brought up. You need to remember that goal location. Where is this thing? What's the angle? What's the distance? And then you need to know how to compare these two things to get there. So in this case, if I'm facing this way and the door is that way, I know it's at sort of a high level, I, I need to turn a little bit to align these two different directions. I just walked you through how we think the brain is figuring out heading. What about goal location? What about how to sort of align these two things? So now I'm going to go back to this movie and I'm going to try to narrate what sorts of information um, we either know or believe is flowing through all these different areas. So this first year I'm, I'm drawing here, this is bringing in visual information. This is the sort of features in the world that flies tracking. That gets packed in to this ring, so it can be uh, further passed on to those head direction cells. So now the fly has a reference between the visual world and um, its internal sense of direction. And then that gets passed through some kind of goal uh, storage location and compared to ultimately get out to these neurons here, which project all the way down the equivalent of the brain's spinal cord to um, trigger movements. So in this sort of one set of neurons, we're going all the way from a sensory or a visual signal all the way out to a motor signal that's telling the fly's body what. And the magic has got to be happening here somewhere in the middle. And we already now know that there are head direction cells um, smack dab in the middle of them. And so um, my colleagues and I went through a lot of effort to try to assign different functions to these different types of neurons, these different stages in this network, which we got from that connectivity or connectome data. So that's a little too complicated. Let's simplify it a little bit. Um, the big picture idea is that you have these different motor or visual cues coming in to the head direction system. That then is used in some kind of navigational computations to select actions or movements and those are then down to actually drive the animal's motions. Okay. So we have the heading. What about the goal location piece? So an illogical place to start would be to look and see what's downstream of these and direction neurons. What's the next step in the circuit? So what I glossed over a little bit previously was that these head direction neurons actually split this head direction signal into two copies, a left copy and a right copy. And those copies were important for those feedback that then shifted the bump one way or another around um, as the fly moved. And there's another set of neurons that arborizes or um, that has gets its inputs here in this mustache shaped area, mustache shaped area from these head direction cells. And this is what they look So they have kind of an interesting overall morphology or shape. All of these blue dots are where they're getting their input. So these head direction cells are communicating with them there. And all these red dots are where they're giving their output. And you see they get pretty strong input fairly far away from where they're giving their output. And then that gets weaker. And I'll skip through a lot of steps here. But what we showed, uh, the function of that is, is that it takes this bump of activity, which in your donut is at a very specific location, and it spreads it out to format it into a cosine before sending it downstream to the network. So what's so special about a cosine? It turns out cosines are really great for vector arithmetic. So I'm probably going to want to draw some on the board here. 
um, which is so if we can imagine we have ultimately what we want to do is we want to get to the end of this vector. So a vector is a distance and a direction. So we want to be able to walk a certain amount uh, of distance in this particular direction, and then we'll get back to our goal. But we need to sort of figure out how to get there. And if we have a given vector, we can encode the uh, overall distance and direction of that vector in a population of neurons. So we're going to have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different neurons. And I've now told you that their activity is going to be some kind of cosine path, that the head direct signal is being communicated to them in that particular way. Let's see if I can draw a cosine. And it looks like that. Some overall cosine shape. We can encode the length of that vector, so how far I need to go in the amplitude of that cosine, so the difference between the most active neuron and the least active neuron. So this is my distance. That's going to be distance is the difference between the two. And we can encode the angle of this vector in the angle of the neuron that's active. And if you remember back to your uh, geometry classes, the really nice thing about cosines is that if you add two cosines together, you get another cosine. And so that's what this example is trying to show. If I have one vector, I may have a cosine that's encoding the direction and the distance of that vector. And I have another vector, and I have another set of neurons that are encoding the direction and distance of that vector and cosine. I can add them together, I get another cosine, and it turns out that this new vector that's being encoded is um, going to be a sum of the two previous vectors. So this is sort of a complicated way of saying that this would allow the brain to know that if I walk three steps this way and turn left and walk four steps this way, that's the same as me having turned a little bit this way and I have to walk three and a half steps, five and a half one step. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we have a head direction signal. And if it can now sort of we can add, use that signal to say, I took three steps in this direction. Now my signal changed, I took four steps in that direction. And we can start to integrate or sum up this different activity. I can overall track this entire vector. So that would be the mechanism for storing a memory then in the overall sort of shape of activity of these neurons, encoding that vector in the phase and the amplitude. Where would you do this in the brain or in the fly brain at least? We want to look at the outputs from these neurons. So who are, who are these neurons that are doing this formatting? How are they communicating? Where are they sending their signal? They send them to another set of neurons. So you see they get their inputs in that same region where we saw those uh, head direction relay neurons. And they send their outputs down this whole new brain region. We call it the fan-shaped body because it looks kind of like a fan. Not very creative sometimes. Um, and if we look a little closer at these, uh, sort of this one example of neurons that are receiving that relay signal, you see that they don't fill this entire area of this new brain structure. They fill sort of a specific realm of it. And if we look more closely at the overall structure of that uh, brain region, we see that indeed it forms these rows. So we can find neurons that cover each of these individual rows and are getting output. We find a whole other set of neurons that seem to um, just cover those specific rows. So these individual neurons are getting information about the animal specific head direction in a given specific column. And they also get information from another set of neurons that cover an entire row. And so we end up with layers and columns. So this looks a lot like um, flash arrays that human beings have designed to store data. You get a row and a column, and you can then store information at the intersection of the two. And so in this case, what we think is happening happening is that these 
individual neurons are bringing in context specific information in a layer. So we measure the activity of some neurons and they respond to pain. And so you might want to know if there's a painful thing in a specific location. So you can get location information from this one set of neurons to build up a vector to that location. You can get pain context here. So now I remember that um, I, don't know, I burned my hand on the heater over there. So I don't want to go to that specific location. And I'm going to store that in this specific layer. And there are other neurons that respond to repetitive cues, so good tasting things. And so if I was that fly and I wanted to remember where that sugar was, I could store that in a whole another row. And the columnar information has been tumbled in direction. So I'm building up, sort of adding up those cosines, which are building up that vector. And now I'm adding context to that, and I can store a specific memory of a specific type of experience in this. So this is a little different from how we think things work in the mammalian brain. But in mammals, we found these things called play cells. And if this is this room, we seem to remember specific locations in this room. So we sort of overall have an entire map of the room. And the fly brain instead looks like if this is my fly, they remember sort of vectors from where they are to specific locations. They have sort of a different way potentially of viewing the environment. They're remembering the angle and the distance of something, but they don't have an overall map of this entire space in the same way that we do. Yes. Do they shift the whole map around as they move? Yeah. Exactly. So they would constantly be updating these vectors and these memories of where things are with respect to specific location. It's um, similar, like in the case that I learned on, you shift signals all the time. Mm -hmm. And when you have stronger signals, you shift on, you get more, more power to it. Mm -hmm. so, but I'm, when I listen to you, I wonder, I'm talking about semiconductors again, isn't that the future of semiconductors building sort of organic circuits? Like what you explained in here? There's, uh, yeah, there's a fair amount of work into exactly building sort of neural network style storage arrays where they're a little more flexible in how data is stored. Um, and the thought there is that the brain is way more efficient at performing computations than our computers are. Right? It's a little bit of sugar, we could do it an awful lot. Um, whereas, the, just the sheer amount of watts. If you had to pedal a bicycle right, to power your computer, you're working really, really hard. That's a lot of effort to make this computation happen. And so there's a lot of work to draw inspiration, both in the hardware of how we store information, um, and that gets a little less publicity, and then also in the algorithms, you know, sort of artificial intelligence and neural networks to, to train up um, a computer to perform specific functions. So you come back that's working. Companies working on that? They are. I know um, IBM works on these, their so called memoristers, where they sort of can apply a little bit of current. They can change the strength basically between two different connections, much like that chemical synapse um, in neurons can be modified to be stronger or weaker. And so there's a lot of active area, uh, research in that area. So if we think about our overall behavior, we now have this whole substrate for storing a goal in this kind of phased array, um, or in this sort of gridded array of rows and columns. But the final step is the animal needs to be able to compare these two. So which way it's going and to which way it wants to go to then change its behavior accordingly. And so what you would want to do for that specific function okay. is compare your current head direction to the direction of the goal. So we think the goal direction is stored in these specific rows and columns of this change of body area. And so I tried to color code that here, where the different direction of the goal would be in a different column. And that's a different color, the star in the ring. And then your head direction would be coming in through those relay neurons up in the mustache, um, this is from the bridge, and I've encoded that here. And so you would want some neurons that could compare a particular angle of head direction to a particular angle of goal direction and see if they matched up. And in fact, we find these neurons. There are two different types of neurons. 
they both get input in that area with the head direction signal and input in that area with the goal direction. And they send their outputs to these motor areas where those sort of spinal cord equivalent neurons are descending down to drive the animal's motion. But they look somewhat different. So there are two types of them. This one type you can see has two different outputs, one on either side of the brain. And this one type has an output just on one side of the brain. So naively then you might think, and you might make a hypothesis, that if you want to go to both sides of the brain, that would sort of be equivalent to moving forward. You're applying now, so you have six legs. It's a little more uh, <laughs> easier to do. Let's see if I can, I, uh, how can I do it? You move forward, you want to be on both sides, but if you want to turn sideways, you really just want to activate one side or the other. And now let's think through that a little more. So when do I want to turn? So I want to turn if I'm facing pretty much away from where I want to go. So I want to compare my head direction over here to a goal direction over there. And that's exactly what you see in these neurons. That if you compare sort of the angle of the head direction they're looking at up here, they're getting input from in the bridge, the angle of the goal direction, they're 90 degrees apart. And so whenever these two things are 90 degrees apart, the animal is going to turn in a direction to a line. And similarly, for these neurons that have outputs on both sides of the brain, they're comparing a head direction to a goal direction at the same position. So whenever those two things are aligned, the animal is going to move forward. So exactly what you sort of might design if you were just thinking through this, that's implemented in the brain of the fly. It's comparing head direction to a goal direction, march forward, and, um, and eventually reach its goal. So coming back to thinking about this overall behavior, the animal wants to get back to somewhere it's been before. It needs to remember that goal. It needs to know which way it's going, and then it needs to go through the steps to align the two and behave accordingly. And sure enough, we see neurons do each of these things in the fly. Brain. So we've gone all the way from what the fly sees to what it's doing through this connectivity path. And um, I haven't shown you the experiment to sort of show that this is in fact what's happening with these different steps. Um, but you know, we have very strong experimental evidence that that's indeed the function of these neurons. And now, as with the head direction cells, which have been found across all these different species, um, we believe that many of these other navigation neural circuits are also conserved. So this was the example of the head direction cell. This is another um, set of data from a reporting in a rat. And these are called goal vector cells because they're always active when the rat is at a specific angle and um, distance from a given goal. So I just talked about these kind of goal vector cells in the fly. These types of cells have also been found in rats. And so as we now determine how that memory is stored in that goal vector area, we can then go back to the circuits like rats and humans and ask if they have similar neurons that are wired together in similar ways to lead to these kind of and even beyond that, just stepping in farther back, in, we think that our lab, uh, really, a large part of our motivation is that we're developing this approach to say, if you give me a connectome, data set of all these different cell types in the brain, and tell me how they're wired up, here's what the steps you would need to go through to then determine the different types of neural circuits, those building blocks of the brain, for what they're doing, how they're doing, um, to then ultimately inform you know, human health interventions, when those sort of things um, go wrong and we have difficulties that result. So that is my talk. I just want to briefly thank all of my wonderful lab members who are actually working on answering the next step of questions in the lab. Um, there are all sorts of interesting problems that we're trying to solve. I've told you how a fly might navigate to a goal, but let's say I'm going to my goal to get out the door and I smell delicious brownies on the other side. Now I have this conflict all of a sudden. Part of me wants to start right, part of me wants to get the heck out of here. What am I going to do? And so the same thing happens in the fly. They're comparing sort of what different brain areas might want them to do. And so that's an active area in our, in our boiling in our lab. How, when you have all these conflicting signals, are you making that decision to say, yeah, I'm going to go eat the brownies or no, I'm going to get out of here and go for a mountain bike ride. Um, another area we're looking at is different types of signaling and that importance in communicating information. I've erased that figure now, um, but there's a lot of complexity in how neurons communicate to one another. And when you take an introductory neuroscience class, you tend to learn they excite each other, they inhibit each other. There's a whole spectrum of other things that we do. 
Um, and we're sort of delving into that, trying to figure out how that helps all these wonderful functions to merge. So I have a couple more minutes here. Um, I'm sorry, I probably continue to talk too quickly and not that much that. I grew up in New England, and it's kind of what we do. Um, I have a quick question. But it entirely. Yes. So when the when the neuron is activated at one end, does it go the whole length of the neuron, or are there steps that um, like a transfer from one to the other to the other to the other, so to speak, to when it gets to the uh, other end of this neuron to activate whatever it's supposed to activate? Um, so you're saying within one individual neuron, when yes. it gets a little bit of chemical signaling, how does that signal ultimately get all the way to the output? Yes. Yeah. Um, so that's a, a very good question. We, there are lots of different um, possibilities uh, uh, for how that information is being conveyed through the neuron. And so that's what I mentioned sort of early on in one of my slides, that these neurons have different input-output properties. And that all comes down to how that information that they're receiving ultimately gets from the input to the output. And so it may be that it's not enough to just have input from one neuron, uh, one sort of partner neuron. It needs two because it's ultimately the, the purpose of that uh, neuron that you're looking at is to multiply two signals together. And so if it's never getting the one signal, it may never actually fully fire. Or maybe it's uh, maybe all it's doing is, is passing that information forward, in which case it would just communicate it directly downstream. And that's going to depend specifically on the membrane properties of the neuron, all the different ion channels that are embedded throughout that are helping to pass that um, electrical signal forward. And so those are the types of uh, things we're looking at in the lab with respect to, for example, this question of what happens if I have conflicting signals? Because the neurons that's comparing the brownie signal and the get out of here signal um, is doing that on these massive um, branches of input. So it's getting input all over the brain. And somehow within um, its, uh, its input area, it's making that decision about which signals to listen to and which ones to follow in shaping the animal's behavior. And I have yes. a question. So if we if we make these comparisons to what's on a computer chip or something, those can have very long-lived stable states because they're just chemicals. But here you've got a living cell. So do neurons have alternate long-term stable states? Yeah. So this is we talked about memories briefly. Um, and memory can mean a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So in this sense of in the head direction signal, the memory was the activity of the neuron. That's not very efficient long term because the, the that neuron's having to use a lot of ATP or a lot of, sort of mm -hmm. energy input to keep firing and to maintain that signal. Mm -hmm. And so there's got to be other ways to store memories sort of longer term. Mm -hmm. And those often involve molecular signals and molecular changes. So you can change the strength of connections between neurons so that now the next time this neuron is activated, it's very strongly connected to the specific one, which is going to sort of kick everything off in a very specific way next time. So you remember that you want to start going mm -hmm. this way and not the other way. Or you could sometimes store um, directly within a neuron specific molecular signatures over um, tens of seconds or minutes. And so that's sort of an immediate way. Can, to can, information. It, can it be also in the, in the little projections from, from individual neurons? You know, this is the sort of thing E works with. It, the, that you could, if you actually make a physical structure in a neuron, or this one connects to this cell instead of this cell, that can persist for a long time, I yes. assume. Yes, and we don't think that happens as much in the fly because they live for a while. Oh, that's uh, true. But right. in mice and rats and humans, we do think we sometimes make send, you know, our neurons send out and make entirely new connections. Yeah. Um, and so I tend to think of it as sort of the human brain. We we talk a lot about cortex, and that's sort of this outer region of the brain. It's very flexible, and that's where he's looking at these new of connections forming. Mm -hmm. There's also a whole lot of a brain that's like your old lizard brain, right? That's uh, just reactionary. And that seems to be a little more hard coded. And so I think particularly in these types of questions we're answering in the fly, we're sort of thinking about that part of the brain that's a little more rigid, that's a little more reactionary and less sort of flexible and allowing you to learn a new patent or whatever mm -hmm. else is moving forward. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there yes. Impressively complicated. <laughs> I wonder how much you really know about the relay states. I mean, how much is hypothetical? How much do you know? 
do we know? So I said they're formatting the activity into a cosine. That we can we've observed their activity and indeed forms a cosine. Um, there are open questions about them that we're looking at in the lab. Um, we're sort of showing that yes, they directly communicate this cosine signal with downstream neurons, but we think they do that in subtly different ways. And so, for example, um, I might really want to know which way I'm going, but I might also want to know which way I came. You know, my mom used to read me Louis L'Amour Westerns growing up, and the browsing from that was always watch your back trail, right? You got to know where you came from, too. And so the beautiful thing, again, about a cosine is that if you take the negative of a cosine, that's the same as the cosine of 180 degrees minus that angle. And so if this neuron can sometimes pass on the positive signal mm -hmm. to some neurons, it's telling those downstream neurons which way the fly was going. And then sometimes it can pass on the opposite, the negative signal, it's going to tell the fly which way it came. And so we found evidence that it can do this different types of signaling to different neurons. Um, it's not always the same type of signal. Mm -hmm. um, another question is this relay neuron is what you would call a hub neuron. You find these types of neurons all over the brain. They're, they're neurons that are taking some important bit of information that your brain has calculated and sending it elsewhere out to the brain. So we're, you know, our brain areas are punching away and they might decide something and they might need to communicate that information all over. And they then are really important because they're these little bottlenecks. And if something goes wrong in that bottleneck, the brain's going to be pretty screwed up because it, lots of parts of your brain need that information. Um, and so these hub neurons seem to have a lot of features, or these relay neurons seem to have a lot of features of these sort of hubs and that they're densely interconnected. They're really trying as hard as they can to be reliable in communicating that signal downstream because if they can't do it, no one else in the brain can, and a lot of behavior is going to go awry. So that's another type of question we're looking at in the lab is how that through resilience and robustness happens within those neurons. Okay, well, right. I, you know, I was asking my my colleagues for speakers every year and they said, oh, you got to get Dan. And I get just got to say, wow, Dan. <laughs> and, and I must say, I, 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 we actually kind of know it at a deeper level than I understood. And yet, it's still so shallow. Right? <laughs> I know. There's a Just long way to go. Truly mind blowing. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. This was a lot of fun. I think I had a class from being back. Thank you to everyone on Zoom. Thank you. I have much more respect for food fighting. Yeah. <laughs> you know where they're going. Belgium, the food fighting. So you need to uh, control brownie versus get out of here.